In the world of sportswear, Nike is so strong, so dominant, and so invincible that its rivals never refer to it by name. There are simply no equals as Nike sells the most athletic footwear and apparel in the world. The closest adversary would have been Adidas, but as we covered back in Season 1, their attempts to challenge Nike only resulted in expensive mistakes. These mistakes eventually cost the CEO his job and set Adidas back years in profits and popularity. It was only through Ultra Boost and Kanye West that Adidas caught back up, but now that Ultra Boost is at the end of its life cycle, now that Yeezy is dead and the latest CEO is on his way out, the future looks uninspiring for the Germans. In the 2010s, there was one American brand that was doing what no one else had been able to do for decades, to grow sales in North America at double digits every year for 13 years straight and to take market share from Nike in its own backyard. This company seemingly came out of nowhere to leapfrog past Adidas as the new number two sportswear brand in the United States with endorsements from major athletes. This tiny brand had everything. It was an upstart company with a passionate fan base, a business that competed on quality over price, and its marketing was backed by some of the most celebrated athletes in the world. While Nike had Ronaldo, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Nadal, and Tiger Woods, this brand had Tom Brady, Steph Curry, Michael Phelps, Lindsey Vaughn, The Rock, and even Captain America. This was Under Armour. Under Armour in the 2010s was hyped as a promising scrappy underdog just a few years away from taking on Goliath. While Under Armour was nowhere near the scale of the swoosh, in the eyes of the media and investors, it was the closest to a Nike slayer that the industry had ever seen, and that enormous potential was quickly priced into the stock. At the peak of Under Armour's hype, I was in college. And as a consumer, my own personal experiences were similar to the market consensus. I'd picked up Under Armour's speed from Fortis, Apollos, and Amp 2.0s. The Fortis and Apollos were mind-blowingly light, soft, and had a level of comfort that I've not found anywhere else since, not even in the latest Ultra Boosts. The biggest issue was the aesthetics. The Fortis and Apollos were like clown shoes. The colorways were hideous, the heels were ugly, but in terms of quality and performance, they were memorable. As training shoes, the amps had slightly better design, but no utility beyond weightlifting. While the design needed work, I would swear to friends and classmates that Under Armour was underrated, and that the company had some genuinely compelling shoe technologies. Yet fast forward to the present, just a few years after the hype and my own personal experiences, Under Armour today is a shadow of its former self. Under Armour these days lags behind not just Nike and Adidas, but also New Balance, Puma, and Lululemon. Even the company's collaboration with Steph Curry, which was meant to rival Nike's billion-dollar Jordan product line, has fallen short. While Air Force Ones, Yeezys, Ultra Boosts, Air Maxes, Blazers, Converse, 574s, and Jordans dominate on the field and on the streets year after year, Under Armour has remained non-existent, and every year things only seem to get worse. Declining sales, executive turnover, failed pivots, expense trips to strip clubs, and federal investigations into dodgy accounting have plagued the company year after year. Under Armour these days has been reduced to a little bit more than a penny stock. How could so much have gone so wrong in just five years? How could a promising brand that had generational athletes like Steph Curry and Tom Brady collapse in such a short time? In this episode, we'll cover the four eras of Under Armour and how their rapid downfall is a timeless case study on governance, tech, and the unspoken dangers of founder-led companies. In the 2000s, Under Armour was in its first era of transitioning from a specialized, athletes-only brand into a mass-market brand aimed at the average consumer. Since Under Armour lacked the history, prestige, and legacy of Nike and Adidas, the company had to compete on merit to cut through the noise. Through the 2000s, Under Armour successfully made a name for itself by reinventing athletic apparel from plain cotton tees into moisture-wicking fabrics. This exclusive focus on athletes helped Under Armour not only achieve differentiation, but also build the confidence of wholesalers, and by extension, establish the fundamentals for a healthy business. In the 2000s, Under Armour was a small player with revenues of less than a billion dollars. The majority of the company's business came from wholesale, where Under Armour sold its products in bulk at a discount to retailers like Big Five, Sports Authority, and Dick's Sporting Goods. These retailers in turn sell these products to customers at the recommended retail price. As an emerging brand, Under Armour didn't have the star power of Nike to occupy the best shelf space and to demand these retailers to buy as much product as possible every quarter. Retailers by nature are cautious creatures. 
They want to minimize every risk of being stuck with unsellable goods and any guarantee possible that the products they're buying in bulk will be bought quickly by customers at maximum markup and with minimal returns. If retailers don't believe that a product will sell, they won't stock it, or if they do, they'll ask for a huge discount in exchange for taking on that risk. While athletes were a niche, they appreciated Under Armour's focus on performance and would seek out the brand at the mall. This gave retailers the gradual confidence to buy more Under Armour products every quarter. The other benefit to winning athletes was that Under Armour could charge more, since they weren't going after the casual soccer mom or beer belly dad just looking for a cool weekend t-shirt. Retailers appreciated Under Armour's premium pricing, which allowed them to reap higher profits on each unit of clothing sold, even at lower unit volumes. Under Armour set high prices in an era where most brands were conservative, like selling $25 tees when everyone else was selling for $10 to $15. Under Armour products were also rarely discounted. In comparison, Nike and Adidas would push tons of products every quarter, to the point that retailers were accustomed to having to aggressively discount the unsold inventory just to make room for the new and latest styles. It took years for retailers to warm up to Under Armour, but once that channel was established, it led to consistent growth and opened up doors for the company to expand beyond apparel. Only a small slice of sales every year was generated through Under Armour's direct-to-consumer channel. But just like with wholesale, Under Armour didn't have the capital or supply chain like its competition to open up stores everywhere it wanted to be. Similar to Nike and Adidas, Under Armour owned and operated two types of stores. The first was a brand store that sold the newest products at full price and evangelized the company to customers in a high traffic area. The second was an outlet store where the company would funnel and sell all their discontinued or excess inventory to sell to the public at a discount so they could maintain full price for in-season products in every other channel. Having both outlet and brand stores are essential for brands to maintain their pricing integrity. Through the 2000s, Under Armour had less than 100 stores in the United States, whereas Adidas and Nike each had thousands of locations worldwide. As a brand for athletes, Under Armour relied most on their wholesale business to propel the company forward. Yet direct-to-consumer in the form of online sales or transactions at company stores was still valuable as a slightly lower priority but higher margin channel where profits could be captured in full without needing to give up a cut to a retailer. In Under Armour's first era, the company had three clear goals. To grow the core apparel business, to expand into footwear, and to drive the international business. The credibility that Under Armour established with athletes and retailers in apparel enabled entry into adjacent higher margin markets like shoes. The long-term hope was that the footwear business would eventually overtake the core apparel business to drive higher profits since you can charge more for a shoe than you can a shirt. The company opted for a crawl-walk-run approach as it forged relationships with Foot Locker and other major shoe retailers. Under Armour started off with its bread-and-butter athletes by rolling out football cleats in 2006, baseball cleats in 2007, training shoes in 2008, and then mass-market running shoes in 2009. By the late 2000s, footwear had grown to account for 10% of annual sales. Even in a recession, the company stuck to its premium positioning, selling shoes for $90 or more in an era where customers were usually used to paying $60 for a pair. The majority of Under Armour's business remained in apparel, while accessories like mouth guards and gloves made up the rest. While most of Under Armour's resources went towards duking it out against Nike at home, the real battles were being waged overseas in growth markets like Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Under Armour wanted a piece, but could not jump into wars it couldn't afford. Growth in the core apparel business and in the US market was necessary to funding international expansion. There were some signals in the 2000s that the brand would translate well overseas. Under Armour licensed away its marketing and distribution rights in Japan to a local partner who took on generating demand, closing sales, and tailoring existing products to the Japanese market. The Japan business was significant not so much in the dollars that it brought in, but more so what it represented as a barometer or proving ground for how the brand would be received overseas. Revenue from licensing represented less than 5% of Under Armour's top line in this first era, as the company willingly gave up monetary value in exchange for presence in the East. Yet this was not some overnight success, as it took nearly 15 years before the Japan business broke $100 million in sales. It's impossible to analyze Under Armour without talking about Kevin Plank. As the founder and CEO, Kevin is the single common factor in every era of Under Armour. He is as much responsible for the rise as he is for the eventual downfall of his own company. Under Armour was a founder-led company in every sense of the term. Kevin was not afraid to champion the brand and to break the conservative cryptic speak of corporate America. 
Just like what Phil Knight had done for Nike, as a founder, Kevin's voice was naturally the loudest, the most meaningful, and always correct. Kevin was a natural storyteller, and that skill was on display in Under Armour's first era. Quote, we charge $5 or $10 more because we have a better product, and that is something that the consumer will pay for in any market. The last thing the market needs is someone else to come in and say, buy my brand because my logo is cooler than the guy next to me. That's not at all what we're doing. It's all about innovation. The smartest college graduates in the world say, if I want to work in IT, I'm going to work at Google. If I want to work in finance, I'm going to work for Goldman Sachs. If Google is developing the next great software, then who is thinking about your apparel? Spurred on by its three growth goals, Under Armour broke a billion dollars in revenue in 2010. This would be the seventh consecutive year in which Under Armour had posted double-digit growth in revenue. The company was averaging 40% growth every year, even during a recession, and the brand was hotter than ever. Strong sales combined with sponsorships with Tom Brady, Auburn University, Cam Newton, and Buster Posey all helped establish Under Armour as a major up-and-coming player in this new decade. But to reach the next billion in sales, the company had to evolve. And appealing to athletes and on performance alone was no longer going to cut it. Moisture-wicking fabric was good for workouts, but had no place in the day-to-day -day leisure or work of the average American. To enter the mainstream audience, Under Armour ported over elements of its athletic products to everyday wear like hoodies, bras, pants, and t-shirts. The underlying thesis was simple. Innovation would drive product quality, which would then enable pricing premiums and differentiation. $70 water-resistant sweatshirts, $30 tees that dried five times faster than regular cotton, $80 infrared cold weather jackets that captured body heat better than anything else on the market, and $100 carbon-plated running shoes were all aimed at the top end of the consumer market. If Under Armour could somehow combine annual double-digit sales growth with industry-leading margins, the company could challenge Nike in ways that no one else had ever done before. Under Armour even went so far as to keep its products off Amazon as it believed the promotion-heavy online environment would dilute the brand's premium positioning. Yet the line between adoption, margin, and pricing is a difficult one to balance. The more Under Armour transitioned away from specialized athletes and towards average shows, the greater the tension became below the surface. Under Armour was anchored to its premium positioning. It was the company's DNA, it had been essential in cutting through the market, and it was necessary in generating funds for expansion. But these same high prices restrained the company from realizing its ambitions of rapid growth and greater market share, which is a function of unit volume rather than unit margins. Premium positioning made international expansion even more complicated. Most Americans were already balking at $70 Under Armour hoodies. To the average European or Asian, that same price tag would be unfathomable. Nike and Adidas had their own high-priced products, but both brands still offered plenty of options for budget-conscious consumers, and this is identical to the barbell strategy of the fast food industry, which we covered in the Burger King episode. This had not been an issue in the football and baseball markets, as Under Armour had sold full-price apparel alongside cleats and accessories to players. But pricing became an issue in running, where the line between the average Joe and the serious runner is a lot less clear. As Under Armour progressed, the company learned that if they were serious about going mainstream, there were instances where they just had to come down on price. The market for a $100 running shoe, especially in a recession, was tiny. No amount of innovation or marketing would convince the average Joe to make such a big purchase for a hobby. Under Armour begrudgingly walked back on price to make its footwear more accessible, and Kevin couldn't hide his frustrations. Quote, we have a product in the market that's done nicely. It's a $70 running shoe. It's a fine shoe. But the fact is, a brand as powerful as Under Armour should be building a much higher price point than that. What I believe is we're supposed to appeal at such a broad level that we should be driving price points for our retail partners so Under Armour shouldn't be 30% off on Black Friday. You won't find us there because we don't participate. We may have an item that we'll use with some partners, but Under Armour is not for discount or on sale. We believe we are a $10 billion brand doing $2 billion of business today. In 2013, Under Armour entered its Nike Slayer era, a four-year period of red-hot growth and hype where the company blew past Adidas to become the number two sports brand in the United States. Investors and media crowned the brand to be the next Nike in the making. The company enjoyed its greatest business performance in history, with annual revenue exploding from $2 billion to nearly $5 billion by 2016. It had previously taken Under Armour four years to go from one to two billion, this time it only took three years to go from two to five billion. 
the streak continued for 13 consecutive years of 27% average top-line growth. And the company had not sacrificed its bottom line to drive sales as Under Armour had maintained a consistent double-digit operating margin. Under Armour had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe against the king in his own backyard in the most competitive and lucrative sportswear market in the world. The international markets in comparison would be a cakewalk compared to North America. As the new sponsor for Notre Dame, UCLA, UC Berkeley, the Naval Academy, Tottenham, Southampton, Colo Colo, Steph Curry, and the U.S. Olympic team at Sochi and Rio, Under Armour looked the part of a kingslayer. Yet it was also in this same era in which the success would go to their heads and would mark the beginning of the end for the company. As Under Armour matured, the company embraced its premium positioning as a positive force and accepted the reality to innovate or die. The challenge with innovation is not only the high cost, but also the indeterminate timeline and unexpected origins. It was around this time in 2012 and 2013 when Adidas had stumbled onto boost technology from a random demonstration at a local chemical manufacturer, and it took the Germans another three years to figure out how to harness that material into a shoe. Under Armour had been making running shoes for nearly five years, and now only in year four did the company finally achieve the breakthrough it was looking for to win the mass market. Speedform was built off of Under Armour's investments in everyday apparel from its first era. The company applied the lightweight, breathable, abrasion-resistant material and design from its women's bra line into its shoes. Speedform shoes were manufactured in bra factories and were some of the lightest ever made, weighing in at just 6 ounces. The strong reception to Speedform propelled Under Armour's footwear business from $300 million in 2013 to becoming a billion-dollar business by 2016. Kevin couldn't resist the chance to talk up the company's achievements. Quote, if you look at the football cleat market, we've been at it for seven years, which means we have the most depth and experience. We've created the number one football cleat, $130 per consumer. It's an unbelievable product that's been authenticated on the field with more than 60 NFL players. The cool kid on the field is wearing our product. As for running, we're in year four. The new speed form was just on the cover of Competitor magazine, with 100,000 runners who are putting 80 miles a week in these shoes. We're going to keep getting better. The fact is that if we believe it bleeds, we can kill it. We definitely think we're drawing some blood and we're going to keep running very hard and do a good job. Kevin's comments could be interpreted as standard founder bravado just as much as arrogance. As a former high school football player and aspiring D1 walk-on at the time, I can say that the number one football cleat was in no way Under Armour. The cool kids wore Nike Vapors and Nike Speeds. There are also over 1,600 active players in the NFL, so validation from 60 players would represent just 4% of the entire league. In its first era, Under Armour took a bottoms-up marketing approach to match its product-led differentiation, relying on athletes to generate awareness to peers and fans. In this second era, the company poured money into advertising to achieve top-down mass marketing. But Under Armour had not actually made it into the big leagues. There were only so many teams and athletes that the company could afford on its smaller budget. Under Armour tried to sign Kevin Durant in 2014 with a 10-year $250 million deal, which would have cost 75% of the company's annual ad budget. In comparison, Durant's final $350 million deal made up just 11% of Nike's annual $3 billion marketing budget. Sportswear was evolving, and quality was no longer enough for differentiation. Adidas had achieved its own breakthroughs in 2015 with Ultra Boost and Yeezy, which captivated the market with style and comfort. Now that performance was ubiquitous, the market was placing a greater weight on aesthetics. Speedform was like all Under Armour products, performance and comfort without style. But to Kevin, investing in design was not enough. That playbook was too boring, too straightforward, and too slow to be the main growth story for his company. In an industry where Under Armour was always playing catch-up, Kevin was desperate for a first mover advantage. He opted for a hard pivot in pursuit of futuristic pastures that would, on paper, amplify penetration into the mass market and create competitive advantages that Nike could never replicate. Kevin found his inspiration in tech, the one sector that you can count on every year to come up with new buzzwords and grand visions to cover up the failures and undelivered promises from the years past. This cycle happens all the time in tech. Take this year for instance, the crash of crypto, the mass layoffs, the startup implosions, and the unsustainability of SaaS companies have all been swept under the rug by hype for AI and the buzz around ChatGPT. Tech is always about the new, shiny thing. During Under Armour's second era, big data and IoT were flavors of the year. 
Big Data promised a world where companies could harness data and derive deep insights that would increase sales, lower costs, and identify consumer trends before they even appeared. Silicon Valley warned that any company not leveraging big data and not making data-driven decisions would be at a permanent disadvantage. Internet of Things, or IoT, promised a future where everything in the world would be connected to the internet and that would forever transform how humans work, live, and play. With IoT, the lights in your home would automatically turn on when people entered the room, your fridge could track how many eggs you had left, your bathroom mirror would show you the weather, your shirt would measure heart rate, and the gym mirror could teach you form and technique in real time. Wearables like Jawbone, Pebble, and Fitbit jumped into mainstream attention, big data vendors like Hortonworks and Sumo Logic exploded, and startups who built their entire business on analytics like Stitch Fix got funded. Big data and IoT spread through hype alone to every industry, even home security as we covered earlier this season with ADT. To Kevin, the future was coming and he was determined not to miss it. Big data and IoT are both based on the idea that data is power. He who collects, processes, and analyzes the most data can do things that no one else can. By 2015, Under Armour had spent over $700 million buying up the three most popular fitness tracking apps, MapMyFitness, Endomondo, and MyFitnessPal. Through these three acquisitions, Under Armour had amassed the largest base of fitness users and by extension, the largest consumer data set of nutrition, workouts, and biometrics in the world. In Kevin's mind, these millions of users and the billions of metrics they generated every day on these apps would fuel a big data engine at the company, which would uncover insights into product development and consumer trends. This would give Under Armour the leg up on its competition. Quote, connected fitness is the future of sport and a place where Under Armour has to be. If Facebook is social, if LinkedIn is business, then who owns health and fitness? We've now created the world's largest digital health and fitness community with more than 120 million members and growing every moment. We want to be the ones to synthesize all this data to make it easy and digestible for anyone to get a complete view of themselves in terms of sleep, activity, exercise, and nutrition. Think about the scale at which this community is growing. 136,000 registrations a day, 40 million new users combined in 2014, one in five Americans are on one of our three apps, 62% of which are women, and 43% live outside of North America. A large percentage of users may be seeing our logo for the very first time. We'll have the ability to impact and mine consistent elements about individuals that can help inform new markets. The data is going to be extraordinary. By 2016, Kevin was showing up at tech conferences and banging a new drum on national TV, proudly proclaiming Under Armour as a tech company. You're an apparel company. What are you doing at CES? No, no, no. We're a technology company. Anybody who's going to live in the future better be there. Imagine, just think about the fact that if I ask anybody on the planet, how many days were you sick last year? Well, we just don't know. We know nothing about it. But why, do you, why do we think that's okay? Like, again, of all the things, like, I could deposit $300 into a checking account, and I could have reams and reams of data of the floating interest rate that went back and forth. Yeah. But if I ask you about your health and say, how many days were you sick last year? You have zero idea, like your most important asset, you know the least amount of information about it. That's something to me that I find absolutely criminal. Despite the rawness of both the space and the vision, connected fitness suddenly became the main identity and principal strategy for Under Armour. Yet it became obvious that no one at the company, not even Kevin, had given thought to how these apps would actually tie back into selling shirts and shoes. Under Armour shifted its R&D focus away from conventional material innovation and design and towards realizing this connected future. Launching $150 smart running shoes that would log your steps and pace, a $150 chest strap that measured heart rate, a $180 fitness tracker, a $180 Bluetooth and Wi-Fi integrated weight scale, and a free mobile app called Records that would consolidate all your health data into a single pane of glass. While no other sportswear company had bet the farm on this like Under Armour, Nike and Adidas still placed chips on the table by launching fitness trackers of their own. Yet all these products would be rendered obsolete as Tim Cook would single-handedly crush this market. With deeper tracking, full-color displays, superior software, better sensors, and an unmatched form factor, the Apple Watch sucked up all the demand for fitness trackers, smart apparel, and connected shoes within two years. For Under Armour, connected fitness as a business in itself was unsustainable. MyFitnessPal, Endomondo, and MapMyFitness had all been bleeding, unprofitable venture-backed startups whose only revenue sources were through in-app advertisements and membership subscriptions. MyFitnessPal, which was purchased for $475 million, posted a $6.5 million operating loss on just $14 million in revenue before its acquisition. 
The Denmark-based Endomondo, which was purchased for $85 million, posted a million-dollar loss on revenue of $2 million. It's apparent that all three companies were purchased for their user data and talent and not for their technology or fundamentals. Connected Fitness contributed less than 3% of Under Armour's annual revenue throughout its existence. Kevin was quick to remind people that the purpose of Connected Fitness was not to generate income, but instead to enhance its apparel and footwear businesses. Yet there was nothing that Big Data would discover that the company didn't already know. You didn't need a billion data points, hundreds of software engineers, and fitness tracking apps to tell you that Under Armour's biggest problem was that its products were ugly. By 2016, that answer was staring Kevin in the face. There were cracks in the core apparel business as revenue had slowed. Connected Fitness had become a costly diversion that had resulted in the company ceding market share and, ironically, losing touch with the same customers whose data it was harvesting. Even fast fashion brands were bringing innovation to their products, which made Under Armour's differentiation on performance and quality alone an inadequate sell. Quote, we need to become more fashionable with the products we have out there. We were counting on the core basic products to generate more sales, but the consumer today frankly has more options. The core basic apparel business is no longer just a few brands and sporting goods that are participating. Consumers now want a product that looks great, that wears great, but also performs, so performance has just become a given. The long-awaited debut of the Curry signature off-court shoes and apparel line was seen as not just an invaluable entry into the mass market through the NBA's hottest player, but also a huge opportunity for Under Armour to break into mainstream consciousness. Yet the $120 Curry sneakers were widely mocked before the product even went on sale. The company combated the negative press by pushing out new models months later with upgraded materials and revamped design, but these moves only reinforced that Under Armour simply couldn't make good-looking shoes. While the Curry basketball shoes sold well on the court, the company had to admit that signature sales were sluggish and that the lifestyle business was significantly softer than expected. Like the tale of Icarus, Under Armour had flown too close to the sun. In the three years between 2017 and 2019, the company found itself in its third era of freefall, incapable and helpless to stop the drop. Revenue, which had grown at 27% on average every year since 2003, plummeted to the single digits as low as 1%. The bill had come due for Connected Fitness, and Under Armour's operating margin was decimated into single digits. Under Armour blamed their multi-year underperformance on a hostile retail environment that had disrupted their wholesale channel and reduced consumer demand for premium products. In the three-year span between 2017 and 2019, major American retailers like Payless and Sports Authority went bankrupt as consumers went online to shop. Yet this excuse rang hollow as Nike and Adidas did not experience the same nosedive in sales even if we compare their results by geography. Anecdotally, this excuse seems even less credible as people were still going bananas at this time for $300 Yeezys and $100 Lululemon yoga pants. People were clearly still spending, just not on Under Armour. MyFitnessPal, Endomondo, and MapMyFitness had collectively grown from 120 million users in 2015 to over 220 million users by 2019, but no business value had actually been generated. After millions in R&D, the internal big data engine was still incomplete. The company had built out the capability to ingest millions of data points in real time, but had no idea how to interpret and apply those findings. It was now 2019, six full years since Under Armour first embarked on Connected Fitness, and Kevin was still out here rehashing the same incoherent script about its opportunity and potential. Quote, Connected Fitness will become a powerful instrument to address this rapidly changing consumer environment. From insight-driven product creation to purchase through end use, this data-fueled ecosystem creates one of the most powerful and unique consumer connections in our industry a true two-way consumer-led conversation that will directly integrate and strategically influence our strategy. This highly sophisticated engine represents a critical asset and competitive advantage as we work towards becoming a $10 billion business. The enormous data opportunity that we have here is incredible. What's different now is that we have an ability to act on it. We have an ability to take that and make it actionable. And I think this is what is so exciting about our future. Unintelligible statements like these made it even more apparent that Kevin was in over his head. Connected Fitness remained the top priority despite the lack of results. Even with a flashy multi-million dollar top line, Connected Fitness posted loss after loss with nearly $600 million of goodwill tied to this failing business. The company replaced Speedform with Hover as its new flagship technology and running shoe, but it was an obvious ultra-boost knockoff in design and material. To show off its tech prowess, 
Under Armour launched its own data-driven subscription service where you could get a box in the mail of personalized Under Armour merchandise every month. None of these products succeeded in breathing life into Under Armour's footwear and apparel business. The diversion of connected fitness and the years of product flops fractured Under Armour's wholesale business. Retailers lost confidence and quietly gave away Under Armour's shelf space to better selling brands. Overseas traction was slower than expected as sales in Europe, China, and Latin America combined for less than a quarter of Under Armour's annual revenue. In an attempt to restore confidence, Kevin subjected investors to an in-person, eight-hour-long, 200-slide fire hose filled with some of the most over-dramatized, over-designed, and meaningless slides ever produced in corporate America. If it wasn't apparent before, it was certainly clear now. Change was needed. Under Armour would enter its fourth and present-day era in 2020, led by a new CEO for the first time in company history. Under Patrick Frisk, Under Armour would return to its roots with a laser focus on apparel innovation and selling shirts and shoes. There was no more talk of big data, insights, tech, or connected fitness. Less than a year on the job, Patrick gutted connected fitness, Armour Box was cancelled, Endo Mondo was shut down, and MyFitnessPal was sold to private equity at a loss. Under Patrick, Under Armour's top line and bottom line recovered, but it was still not anywhere close to the double-digit growth of the past. Patrick was burdened with turning around not just product direction and strategy, but also company culture and corporate compliance. Reports soon emerged that under Kevin, company employees visited strip clubs on company dime, while male executives regularly engaged in sexual misconduct, had romantic relationships with subordinates, and threw parties where female employees were invited based on their attractiveness. Things only got worse when the SEC announced fraud in Under Armour's financials. In the four-year Nike Slayer era in which Under Armour had enjoyed the biggest hype, the greatest stock appreciation, and the most significant sales growth, company executives had manufactured some of that growth by pulling forward revenue on weak quarters to hit analyst targets and to exceed guidance. Under Kevin's leadership, executives would ask finance and sales to look for orders that retailers had placed for the future and then ship them out early in order to recognize the sale in the current quarter. This meant that retailers would take on inventory well in advance before they could even be sold, like taking on shipments of spring products during winter. To convince retailers to take on this inventory, they were given bigger discounts to accept early delivery. Under Armour had secretly pulled forward nearly half a billion dollars of orders between 2015 and 2016 to maintain their double-digit growth. This manipulation is a much better explanation for the massive drop between 2016 and 2017, when Under Armour's growth plummeted from 22% to just 3% in a single year. In reality, the Nike Slayer era was just two years long, and the decline in apparel and footwear had been happening long before 2017. While Under Armour was still trending down, the company was objectively in a better place under Patrick's leadership by the measure of business performance, brand identity, and culture. Growth was solid but unspectacular. Yet Patrick lasted just two years at the helm before unexpectedly stepping down in 2022 without an explanation. Under Armour has since appointed a new CEO in Stephanie Lenartz, a Marriott executive with nearly 30 years of experience in the hotel industry. But at this point, it's unclear who's still really paying attention. The media has tried to explain Under Armour's collapse, pointing to the typical doing too much too fast as the root cause. But to chalk it up to a few incompetent executives is poor analysis as that kind of dirty laundry exists in every company. While Kevin was out chasing IoT and big data, the market was actually evolving to the point where sportswear brands were better defined by their shoes rather than their slogans. If you look at the messaging and marketing across Nike, Under Armour, Adidas, and Puma, it's all very homogenous. It's all about positivity, fitness, empowerment, inspiration, speed, performance, grit, determination, etc. When everyone is saying the same thing, no one is actually saying anything. Adidas is actually better defined by its Ultra Boosts, NMDs, Stan Smiths, and Yeezys, while Nike is best defined by Jordans, Air Maxes, and Air Forces. Under Armour's lack of a flagship shoe and product meant that there was nothing visible to anchor, define, and embody the brand for modern consumers. Throwing half a billion dollars in advertising every year won't fill that void, and Under Armour should have kept iterating on speed form until they perfected its design. The second piece is connected fitness. It's a little unfair to fault Kevin for falling victim to Silicon Valley hype, as he's not the first, nor will he be the last CEO to get caught up in a venture capitalist pump and dump scheme. But the founders behind MyFitnessPal, Endomondo, and MapMyFitness all deserve some attention as these were individuals who were paid very handsomely and were the ones who had actually come up with the vision for connected fitness. 
While it's not politically correct to judge people based on their physique, most of these founders were clearly not even people into fitness or nutrition for themselves. The point here is not that you have to be an athlete to create value for athletes, but more so that these were just nerds, for better or worse, who lucked their way into a big payout. They had all built their apps when smartphones were just taking off, and they had achieved rapid adoption through first mover advantage. Kevin certainly should have been more cautious about Greenfield Technologies, but at the same time, he entrusted Connected Fitness to these founders by appointing them as C-level executives after acquisition. These founders all bounced as soon as they vested at the two-and-a-half-year mark, leaving behind a trail of conflicting visions and half-assed work that would doom any team or project from the start. The other lesson here is that data is garbage. While big data and IoT are both based on the idea that data is power, the reality is that data is only useful if you can interpret and apply it. Collecting data for the sake of ingestion and aggregation in itself is useless. The central problem with MyFitnessPal, Endomondo, and MapMyFitness is that even if all these apps had a billion active users, the data that they would generate in sleep, nutrition, and fitness has no inherent business value. Knowing that 10 million people on the West Coast run on average 3 miles a day, consume 2,400 calories, and prefer to eat chicken for lunch is more useful for a census taker, a data broker, or a market research firm than it is for a sportswear company. The last lesson is about corporate governance. While the market regards founder-led companies favorably today, corporate governance is like a spectrum in which founder-led companies are one extreme and private equity is on the other. As we covered in the Burger King episode, private equity can be a problem as the owners are too detached, they oversimplify business into a spreadsheet, they're tunnel visioned on short-term optimization, and they take an uncreative peanut butter approach with strategy. Founder-led companies are the opposite, where the founder can become overly attached despite having good intentions, they're too involved in every single aspect of the company, they suffer from a god complex, they feel pressured to produce grand visions like Steve Jobs, and they turn the company into a platform for personal fame. While founders are invaluable for the charisma and passion that they bring to early stage startups, they can just as easily turn into liabilities where they develop too much power, influence, and personality. As the founder and CEO, Kevin's vision and enthusiasm were essential for the survival of Under Armour in its first era. The company's early success cemented Kevin as a visionary and granted him unchecked autonomy, authority, and freedom to run Under Armour in any way he saw fit, even if that meant allowing employees to expense visits to the strip club. It also allowed him to assemble a boardroom of obedient executives who wouldn't challenge his decisions, like dropping $700 million on unprofitable fitness apps whose own private post-money valuations were nowhere near their final purchase price. Only founders with their unparalleled privilege and mythical reputations can make such drastic radical changes in a company's direction so quickly and can stick on with bad investments for so long without being directly challenged by the board, employees, and investors. In 2020, Kevin was not actually forced out as CEO. Instead, he voluntarily stepped down before that conversation could even happen. In doing so, he gave himself a position where he would still have control over the company. Even though Under Armour has had two external CEOs in the past three years, these CEOs formally still reported into Kevin and not to the board exclusively. Under Armour's finances even point to a mysterious chief operating decision maker, an individual who is not the CEO who makes CEO-like decisions about allocating resources and assessing performance. All signals point to Kevin as this chief operating decision maker, which leaves the CEO as nothing more than insulation and a political puppet. If Under Armour had a conventional corporate structure, this kind of hierarchy would never exist, CEOs would not be reporting into founders, Kevin would not have been allowed to bet the farm on connected fitness without first performing significant due diligence, but at the same time, Under Armour might not ever have been successful, and the brand would likely have been sold to private equity for parts during its initial freefall. When you come from millions, you seek billions. And when you achieve your billions, you value purpose. As a billionaire who was born into millions, the last thing Kevin needs is more money. For Kevin, Under Armour is his life's work. As long as the company stays alive and he gets to run the show through a proxy that keeps him out of public scrutiny, Kevin has demonstrated that he's happy to do so, even if that means running Under Armour into the ground. 